Totally. So basically, it was just a, a massive earthquake in Japan. Uh, I think it was Richter 9.0, or maybe even a little bit bigger, and uh, it killed 16,000 people with the tsunami that followed, and also uh, the Fukushima reactor. You ever had a thought turn into a rabbit hole? We're here to help. I'm Kyle. I'm Connor. And welcome to Deeper Perspective. Oh my god, bro, you let you pick him up? Hey guys, Kyle, Kyle here again with another Deeper Perspective episode. Uh, we actually have a very special guest. Today is my birthday and this kid has known me for most of my life. So um, if you want to introduce yourself. Hey, uh, first of all, happy birthday, Kyle. Um, my name's Noah. And uh, yeah, Kyle's been my next door neighbor since, or, or well, well, he is not now, but we were... Uh, four or something like that so yeah i think i think we were six and your sister was actually yeah, some, four something like met. that and then your youngest brother was in diapers he was yeah. it's kind of crazy but um now now we're kind of all grown up and uh it, it, it's nice to reconnect and honestly have you on the podcast today. yeah definitely um i know that you you, you do a lot of cool stuff, especially with uranium trading. Oh, okay. um, do you kind of want to like talk to some of our guests about yeah, that? Yeah, uh, yeah, we can talk about that first. Um, so I, well, first I should say I, I started out with like trading and investing, uh, really got interested in it with um, Bitcoin like you know, five years ago. And I, uh, if I had just like held on to what I had, I, it would have been real investing, but I just, you know, I spent a lot. I lost a lot. I, um, yeah, I'm definitely not rich by any means, even though a lot of the people that I, uh, got started with at the same time are, um, but yeah, I mean, from that, I went to, uh, looking for other opportunities, um, that felt more tangible and had like a, um, a real use case. I mean, not that Bitcoin doesn't, but I, I just felt that it wasn't really, and it still isn't necessarily proven yet as a, a currency. Um, so it's, it's kind of interesting because Bitcoin's kind of like a bottomless account. So it's, it's one of those things where the more people that buy Bitcoin, uh, like because it's kind of like trading at the simplest form there's only so many bitcoin that get released every once in a yeah. while yeah but if the demand for demand for bitcoin's higher then the price goes totally up. But if the supply is higher then the price drops and it's super volatile yeah it, it's very volatile um and it grows extremely fast i mean as we've seen it's gone from five thousand to 57,000 I think it is today uh in the last year so that's pretty insane growth for yeah it's been hitting all-time highs the past few days um so yeah pretty impressive but yeah again like I said I mean there's there's companies that are starting to accept it as payment but it doesn't necessarily um feel to me like it has like a true use case yet. I mean, other than maybe like, I don't know, I kind of vibe with the digital gold idea that it's that kind of asset. But anyway, on to uranium. Um, I found it when I was looking for another asset that like, you know, would have a, a big risk reward trade off um, uranium after the Fukushima incident was in like a 10 year long bear market. Uh, so prices were really beat down on all the associated stocks, mostly miners. So I think, yeah, like down like 95% from the, the top in 2007, 2008, 
right before Fukushima, which was, you know, a uranium bull market. And um, Fukushima definitely ended that. I mean, people got freaked out by nuclear once again. Would, would you be able to, uh, for, for some of our viewers that might not know too much about like uranium or investing, um, would you be able to kind of like explain what ha happened in Fukushima? Yeah, totally. So basically it was just a, a massive earthquake in Japan. Uh, I think it was Richter 9.0 or maybe even a little bit bigger. And uh, it killed 16,000 people with the tsunami that followed. And also uh, the Fukushima reactor, that's what the, the incident was. Basically, it, it got um, flooded and shut down and went into a meltdown. Uh, basically, yeah, they were just were, they didn't think that they could ever have an earthquake that big. Their geologists were kind of like a little bit off on their predictions. Um, so they just weren't prepared for, for something that big. And the reactor went into meltdown and then um, it, it flooded, you know, radioactive water into the Pacific ocean for months and that, you know, radioactivity has since reached, you know, all around the world, basically. I mean, they were finding pretty decent levels of cesium in, in fish on the, you know, off the coast of California. So it's it's everywhere, but I it's remember, very low um, amounts. When, when this actually happened, I actually <clears throat> remember reading about it. And a lot of people are saying besides Chernobyl, this was actually more tragic and a bigger issue than the Chernobyl reactors, which went down. And that was like the first time in a while that we saw something like this, like where, where a nuclear reactor was having a lot of issues and it caused so much radiation and, yeah. and mutation. And I guess what, what are your takes on like on this and Chernobyl and like are, are nuclear reactors a good thing or are they kind of seen as something that's so, too dangerous? So, yeah, it's interesting because like we have this really scary view of nuclear reactors because of Chernobyl and because of Fukushima as events that, you know, are super harmful. And, and Three Mile Island was another good one um, or good example, not good event. But <laughs> um, yeah, <laughs> but basically, if you actually it's very interesting, um, if you compare deaths as a result of power generation across you know nuclear solar wind going up to coal natural gas nuclear is at the very bottom of that scale and it still produces you know around 15 to 20 percent of the world's energy it's kind of crazy so because it's, because it's seen as this dangerous <laughs> thing by the public but it's actually more efficient yeah, like statistically, it's killed far less people than any other um, like source of energy generation due to pollution and especially with coal, like that's easily tracked. That kills millions of people a year can be um, attributed to death by air pollution from coal. So basically, I, the appeal I saw in, in nuclear was... Um, a lot of different reasons. I mean, for one, I'm a pretty big environmentalist. And so at first I was like very skeptical because I was like, you yeah, know, uh, renewables seem like the way. But um, I learned more about, you know, the mining involved in making renewables. Um, and, and I watched, I, I don't remember exactly which it was, but I'll see if I can find the link after this and send it to you. It was a really great TED talk. The link, link will be in the, the description, guys. Yeah, and it was just about, you know, the benefits of nuclear and comparing it to renewables and stuff like that. And just the science behind it is really good. Like, it's carbon free. So it does generate waste, but that waste is, is relatively stable and low ra radioactivity. So it's not very dangerous. And, and they, um, they store it really safely. I mean, in bedrock, like you know, hundreds of feet underground where it will be, you know, not, it will, it won't be radioactive by the time that the storage facility, you know, breaks. Those storage facilities are 
meant to last for a million years. That's how long they're designed. And the half-life of most of those elements is like 30,000 years. So plenty of time. Um, it, it's not going to get into the groundwater or anything. Well, so you know, I, I, I know like, like <laughs> uranium seen as like this, um, I guess like super harmful chemical if it's not stored properly. But like how, how does the uranium price get affected from here on out after that like nuclear reaction? Yeah, so, so yeah, talking about price and as an investment, um, basically what we've seen after Fukushima is like, you know, uh, a big move away from nuclear and in terms of, well, not necessarily move away, but like people are scared of it. So like the sentiment is pretty low, but um, it's still, go it's still, you know, a very big source of energy generation in the US, in Europe, in Russia, China, like they all use a significant amount of nuclear energy. And um, that is projected to grow 40 to 50% at least in the next 20 years. And if not more, if people start to like get more on board with it again, because one thing that's cool is like after Fukushima, the whole industry spent hundreds of billions of dollars really trying to uh, improve the safety of reactors and, and make sure that that couldn't ever happen again, like an earthquake induced meltdown. And, and, so and with all that, safety, and then so all those safety precautions make it easier for diplomats <clears throat> to basically accept this as an energy source now. Yeah, I mean, they already do. It's more just about getting the public on board. I mean, a lot of, you know, it, it's an interesting issue because it's quite bipartisan. Like, you know, like with renewable energy, like, you know, there's a big fight on, on the right of, you know, like, oh, fuck the Green New Deal. Like, you know, what we just saw happen in Texas, like, um, you know, a lot of people were trying to blame it on the wind power and, and then a lot of people on the left were trying to, <clears throat> you know, use it to advance the Green New Deal idea. And um, nuclear, actually, it's interesting, in Texas did go down as well, uh, along with natural gas for the same problem. Uh, they didn't have the right winterizing systems there. Um, on the nuclear plant so the water pump for the reactor froze in one of the plants and took like 30 megawatts offline but you know compared to all the natural gas and coal that went offline that's you know nothing so anyway getting to the main point um nuclear is going to keep growing the demand is going to keep growing um and there's there's new technology there's like smaller more efficient reactors and they're much safer and those are designed but they haven't really been built yet so we're just waiting on investment in those to really see increased demand but we already there's a big supply deficit like uh the covid basically shut down like a lot of mining this year which exacerbated a problem that was already arising which is like they're just you know because of the low price of uranium like a lot of mines just weren't producing so but there's still reactors using it so there is a growing supply deficit and um the prices are starting to skyrocket i mean some of the stocks have grown like 400 percent already and um you know they're I mean, there's a lot of stocks that have grown 400% since the crash in March, but uranium is, is looking really good as, as a commodity to, to hedge against any potential future, you know, instability in the market. And um, just as a long-term case of, of just, you know, we always need energy. We're going to need more energy, especially when electric cars come out um, in force, you know, like... We, we're all going to be driving electric cars in 20 years, and that's going to require, you know, at least 100 percent more energy than we use right now. So um, kind of a more we need to generate kind that. of a more fun question then about electric cars. Um, I guess do you kind of see Elon <clears throat> Musk as somebody that's leading kind of like the path for that? Or do you kind of see it more of like every every car company is kind of moving towards it? 
Yeah, I mean, Elon Musk is definitely still in the lead, um, but I think other companies are catching up at this point. Like they're like GM is going fully electric uh, with their whole lineup. Um, there's yeah, I mean, every major car manufacturer is basically like besides like Mazda, which I I still think Mazda makes great cars, but they haven't done much with electric yet. Um, but yeah, every other major uh, manufacturer is is going electric, and you know there's still some things to be worked out, but that's that's happening for sure. And Elon himself actually said like we are going to need uranium uh, or nuclear power to power all these cars because we don't have like solar and wind are just too inconsistent right now. And that's kind of powerful. Actually, look at the yeah. difference. Kind of going off of that. <laughs> Sorry for cutting you off, but um, when, when, yeah, when, no, you're when, good. whenever somebody of power actually tweets uh, for all of you that don't know a lot about investing or don't know a lot about companies that I could actually change the entire projection of a company. So if somebody tweets something, for example, um, whether it be a politician or like someone that's major in that industry, that could either drastically drop a stock price overnight or it could actually increase it. So um, whatever Elon does say about uranium could actually really affect that stock price. Totally. I mean, and it's a really, it's pretty small industry too. Like there's, I think there's like 60 miners that you could invest in uh, like total. I mean, across like Australian stock exchange, Canadian stock exchange, um, and New York stock exchange. And I don't know if there's actually any even. All right, guys, we had a, a little blip here. Uh, <laughs> we're at it back, up. back wow. to it. <laughs> so back to, yeah, I guess we were talking about Elon Musk, um, and talking about how he, yeah. a oh, small industry. Yeah. There's like 60, miners um across all the exchanges pretty much that you can invest in and um so it's you know but definitely institutional money is here and it's it's coming in more i mean blackrock owns a significant portion of a lot of the miners like you know upwards of five percent in some cases and um yeah, I mean, as an investment, it looks really great, but also as just like a solution for, uh, you know, carbon free power, which is something that is going to be a huge issue, you know, going forward, it already is. But I mean, we need to, you know, figure out how to reduce our, our carbon emissions. As Absolutely. Much as possible and we're, we're we already seeing the ramifications stay in the of same kind change. of world, like, like take mean, Texas, for example, you know. 20 years ago, Texas would not be in a total lockdown in apocalyptic mode with snow on the ground. And at minus 15, 15 degree <laughs> weather, like that, that's something new to the, to the human race. Yeah. Like, I mean, Texas, you know, it doesn't get cold like that. Totally. Yeah, I mean, weather's always unpredictable. Like, I'm guessing that, you know, even without climate change, Texas probably had a couple, you know, once in a hundred year storms like that. Um, so it, you know, but yes, that that storm was, you know, due to a, a like a less predictable jet stream. Basically, the jet stream is um, kind of moving further south and, and it's acting strangely because of the temperature increases on average um, in the globe and yeah going forward we're just going to see more crazy weather it's not going to necessarily mean like our winters feel warmer all the time even though it has been a pretty warm winter besides this vortex thing um, but yeah we're just going to see like more intense hurricanes you know more intense winter storms changes in precipitation in certain areas like the the north is going to get more precipitation uh probably as most models are kind of showing that whereas the southwest where we live is gonna <clears throat> Honestly, dry out that's and really burn scary, out, but like, um, completely, the, the so. thing we can do is go more yeah. renewable or we could use more nuclear <laughs> energy more solar more wind things that are less less polluting than some of the other energy sources maybe go electric like you were saying with cars um, but I, I know you're, you're, you're super knowledgeable in like all of these topics. And, um, I also yep. know that we were talking about like drones earlier. 
I guess like what it what do you what do you do with drones? Because I know you do like you have some cool projects yeah. going on with those. Yeah, so that's uh, another one of my interests for sure. I I love. Um, I mean, really, I, I built my first drone like ten years ago, and I was gonna try to do like commercial aerial photography before drones were even regulated, really, and the technology just wasn't quite there yet like i couldn't get like smooth video it was really shaky is that the hero on one the first gopro is that, the hero that one they ever was that made before hero? so it wasn't it was like 1080 <laughs> yeah the the hero one yeah the hero one so you know i mean it was cool for its time but it, it just wasn't like you know it it didn't come close to what helicopters could do with movie cameras and the cool thing now is that gap is like really closing. Like, um, there are definitely still some things that drones can't do compared to helicopters, but you know, like any old person now can buy a 4k drone for a little over a thousand dollars and go and make like really amazing content, um, right off the bat. So, yeah, I'm actually um so right now I'm actually so I I have a 4K yeah, exactly. camera on my phone. Yeah, I mean there the are S20 Ultra. There are a it's couple phones. I think it's a Samsung that offer an 8K camera. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I mean there there are a couple phones. I think it's a Samsung that offer an 8K camera now um on the phone. And and you know, there's DSLRs that are offering 8K. I mean, that's you know, that's resolution that only movie cameras could get. Even five years ago, movie cameras weren't getting 8K. And now phones are getting 8K. Ten years ago, we won a film <clears throat> festival with 48, 480p. <laughs> do you remember yep. that? Like I do. The, the, the times I have think, changed. And I, know I think we that was even... That on, yeah, yeah. Go on. I think, I think that was even... Probably. Close yeah, that was more than 10 years ago at this point today, almost. Probably so like, fifteen, yeah, or, or probably more like fifteen. 12 or <laughs> yeah, probably close yeah. to at least something I mean, like that. Today, probably fifteen, yeah, or, or probably more like twelve or thirteen years, but somewhere in there. But um, I I, I do remember like um talking with this about like Joe, and she was on our last episode or two episodes ago. But um, yeah. she was talking about how like she bought like twenty or thirty thousand dollars a camera. It gets outdated over like yeah. the course of her career, and every every single like year basically you yeah. have to upgrade or yeah so 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 you have to learn how to make the equipment totally yeah it's a it's a tricky right industry there. to be in. I mean you know like I would almost say like renting makes more sense right now until things <laughs> slow down a little bit like. You know, if you need a camera to make a project, like, might as well rent it, honestly. <clears throat> Even, I don't know if you can rent, yeah, I don't know if you can rent drones yet, but maybe in, in some places. Um, but anyway, yeah. It's not a bad idea. Um, but anyway, you, um, yeah. Don't, don't you use drones in uh, real estate as well? Yeah, so that's like my, that's how I make money with it, which uh, granted, it's not a lot of money. Um, my dad's a realtor, so I have that helpful connection there. And basically, whenever he gets a property that, you know, we he wants to market better, um, like it really especially works well for like ranch properties, like big properties where you want to showcase a lot of land all at once. Um and so, yeah, we can just take the drone out there and and shoot it. And um, I've done a couple other small jobs. Like I helped film uh, the, New Year, the New Year's Eve fireworks in Santa Fe um, for KOB TV. And they like patched. Um, are, are, are we allowed to play that clip for the viewers? the fireworks uh yeah yeah i i can send you a clip of mine that i recorded or you could you could play the kob broadcast um and i could just point out like which shots are mine um but I, either one that you want to do um 
but yeah, no, that was a cool project because uh, I, I just like worked with these guys That'd here really who cool. do like cinematic um, drone stuff so they can carry like a big movie camera with their drone. It's a huge drone. And then they have some smaller Inspire 2s, which are still really, you know, they're $6,000 drones, but they're not like as big as their heavy lifter. Um, so yeah, we, I just like worked with them and we, we used my smaller drone, the, the Mavic 2 Pro um, to plug, like to do the high angle shots. And uh, then they use the Inspire to get the, the closer in shots and uh, yeah. How, how hard is it to like fly a drone in that environment? Because like you have fireworks going off and that's kind of like a, you know, pr projectiles are literally in the air while you're flying this thing. Like, does that change like the wind or? Yeah. So yeah, we're, no, not necessarily, but like it was a pretty calm night. Um, first of all, you can't fly at night unless you have a special waiver, which these guys did. So I was able to fly under their waiver. Still working on getting my own waiver, although the rules are changing shortly that uh, anybody with a, a drone license will be able to fly at night at the proper lighting. But um, yeah, that was the main thing was just flying at night with the, the special waiver. Uh, that was the biggest challenge. But we didn't like fly through the fireworks, which I know there are some people who do that. Um, you, I've seen a couple drone videos of people flying through fireworks, which it looks amazing, like no doubt, but it's also an easy way to lose your drone, which, you know, if you spent $2,000 on it, you don't really want to get it knocked down by a firework. So, so the only time you'd want to do that is if it's like the London uh, fireworks show on New Year's Eve, or like something big enough to where the money reward for losing your drone would be worth it. <laughs> Yeah, and I mean, there there are ways you can, like, build a, a drone that's going to be, like, way cheaper. Like, um, you can, like, you know, put together a drone for about 300 bucks, you know, uh, minus the cost of the controller and stuff. And if, if you, like, set up a, a data link on that, then, yeah, you could say, okay, like, you know, I could take a hit with this and, and lose it, and it would be still probably worth getting the footage um it's really cool actually like there's so much happening in the industry right now so there's this company i follow called beverly hills aerials and they've been doing nascar and nhl uh drone shots now so this is like first time that's ever happened um it for with drones it's so cool but like 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 your drones like are, are are getting into major sports that are becoming more prominent in the military. But like if you think about it, everything we've talked about, like all the way from the uh, like nuclear power yeah. plant, um, basically the energy is produced where you could charge your drone through using that energy, and then electric cars you could charge them through using. Yeah, the totally. Energy. So like all of it kind of ties back yeah. into each other. The it's major kind of limitation that we're facing with all of that is batteries. I mean, drones can only fly for. 30 minutes tops if it's like a very well-designed drone and um the bigger ones the ones that lift like huge movie cameras they fly for like five minutes and that's it so <clears throat> they got to get up there get their shot and land before they run out of battery and drop their twenty thousand dollar camera <laughs> So yeah, I actually um I, I I did a research paper a couple of years ago about that where it was basically they're trying to figure out ways to have better battery capacity and I don't know if they have already but basically like more battery capacity so people actually see electric cars as more of a like more yeah, of an totally. actual like mainstream thing because like the public is like I want to charge my car just to drive four hours <laughs> I want to be able to drive that thing across hundreds of hundreds of hundreds of miles and get to my destination yeah. and so it's pretty amazing what tesla's done with it already like they they have a car that has like 500 miles of range which is pretty close to what you could get in a gas powered car anyways there's some if gas powered more, cars yeah exactly that, that's more than my tank <laughs> i mean yeah my prius gets me about 290 miles on one tank um on the highway which is like so, a two gallon tank. <laughs> yeah, but you can fill it up really fast. So like that's the nice thing about that. But yeah, the same limitation with drones. Um, 
like you have the battery and then you're carrying around dead weight once the battery is empty like with gas if you had a gas powered drum which they do exist um they're not super popular but they you know the, the weight of the fuel goes away when you burn it up so it makes it more efficient as it goes and with uh, a battery it's just you're carrying around that dead weight after you've used the power so for aircraft it's really hard to use batteries um but Speaking yeah we're just kind of you've flown planes before too right <laughs> yeah yeah i i'm kind of you know slowly working on my private pilot's license it, it's really expensive and uh you know lots of hurdles to clear but i'll get there one day <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Um, I guess like yeah. kind of a closing closing question for our viewers because we kind of want to keep it short. Um, totally. I guess like oh, where, where do you see technology taking us? Where do you see like the new energy sources of the future tomorrow? Like where, where do you um, see all of these things ending up? Well, I think like nuclear is cool because it's like it's going to be good for like the next 50, 100 years. But I think we can do better than that. Like, I think we can, you know, come up with something where we don't really have waste and we produce endless amounts of power and it's basically free for everybody. Um, so like cold fusion would be one, you know, area where that would be cool to see a breakthrough in that in our lifetime. Who knows if it's going to happen. Um, but yeah, I think we'll solve the the power issue in our lifetime where, you know, like we, it'll just essentially become free to us. Like we're going to, you know, and, and a lot of corporations are not going to be happy about that. But um, we're already like getting closer. I mean, solar is so cheap these days, like cheaper than coal, you know, and it's not even subsidized like coal is. So um it's crazy definitely um, cause, getting there because i i actually think i'm going into solar sales and it's crazy because if you actually look at like solar sales like people think of it as like sales or like i'm being sold something solar literally like all it is is an appointment to tell you how much you're saving on your energy bill yeah i mean <laughs> you actually and like it. like it, it yeah and like 10 years ago you know, 10 years ago, I think it was harder to sell solar because it was like, well, yeah, you invest, you know, $40,000 here and then you pay it off in 10 years or so. But now there are companies that are offering like, you don't pay a dime, like we'll come and install solar. And instead of, you know, paying an electric bill, you just, you know, pay like a small mortgage on on the solar, uh, not mortgage, but you know. Yeah. And then after, after 10, 10, 12 years, whatever your financing plan is, then your energy yeah. is completely free. Yeah, exactly. Oh, yeah. And, and so, you know, it, and it's like, usually like what you're paying to finance the solar panels is less than what your electric bill was. So, you know, it's, it's a pretty good deal for most people if they own their house. Like, you know, if you're renting, obviously it doesn't matter, but cool. I, I, yeah, mean, we're I, getting I there. guess so, so some, someone that's like into like, say solar energy, uh, electric cars, like super knowledgeable about drones, like what kind of advice would you be able to give our viewers on kind of getting into this stuff and learning more about it? Uh, I mean with drones, like, uh, if you want to do any commercial work, you got to get your FAA license, but it's pretty easy. Um, it took me like two weeks of studying and pass the test and then they mail you your card and, and you can go and, and fly and, and make money. And um, yeah, it's hard. It's a very uh, competitive industry and there are people who are like very far ahead in it already. Um, but there's definitely still small jobs like to be had. So and then as far as, I don't know, just like energy and stuff, um, I, a lot of the information I get is off of Twitter, um, just like following the right people. Um, and yeah, just, you know, reading about the new advancements. I mean, it's, it's just exciting stuff because it's, you know, always improving every day, basically, and we're seeing new breakthroughs. So just keeping on top of that is basically the best way um, to stay in the loop. You just, you just always have to be, always have to be looking at stuff, always researching, keeping up to date because I mean, everything we've talked about is just moving so moving so fast that if you don't keep up for a day, you lose a lot. Yep, like exactly. It, it really, it really is. You got to put it into your schedule. It sounds like. 
Yeah, but it, I mean, I don't know. I mean, if it interests you, I feel like it's pretty easy to to read about it for five minutes a day. Um, you know, just click on an article that you know piques your interest. Um, but yeah, it's it's exciting stuff because you know I think some people don't necessarily like take the time to think like you know how do we get our power and like how is that going to improve and how is that contributing to you know our, our issues like like climate change you know so how how can we make that more efficient um so i think you know the people who are solving those problems are going to be you know the most successful entrepreneurs in our generation i mean like look at elon musk richest man in the world yeah so <laughs> Absolutely. I, I think yeah. that's a great note to end on, honestly. Um, dude, I, I really appreciate talking with you. Like I, I wanted you to be a guest because I know how knowledgeable you are about so many different facets of society, energy, drones. We were talking about <laughs> Thanks, uranium. Man. Like We were kind of all over the place, but it was great. Yeah, um, no, that was fun. Definitely. Thanks for having or? me on. Uh, no, I'd say I'd say what I said. I think that was a good place to end it on. But yeah, thanks for having me on and uh, happy birthday. Go enjoy your day, man. And um, yeah, let, I'm excited to see the episode air and see the future of, of your podcast. I think it's a cool project. So cool. Well, uh, thanks again, Noah. And honestly, yeah, um, I'll see, see you back home when I come visit. Yeah, sounds good, man. See you soon. Alrighty, guys. And um, that is it for this episode of Deeper Perspective. If you guys want to like, comment, and subscribe, hit the bell notification if you can. All of this stuff will be on screen. Um, this, uh, this was a great episode, and I look forward to seeing you guys next time. Talk to you all later. Peace out.